I do remember uh, Roenick a little bit. He did. He worked in corporate when he was at GE, and it is really uh, with great sadness that uh, that I'm here today in his memorial. And I'm sure he was a great colleague and friend. So uh, you have my sincere regrets. So uh, you know what I what I thought I'd do today because I got very strict instructions from your leadership team not to make this a GE commercial. I'll do that in Q and A. I, I won't miss that. <laughs> I won't miss that opportunity. But what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about the world, but talk mainly about leadership. What what I view as kind of some of the attributes of good leaders of this generation and, and, uh, and then let, you, let the conversation go wherever uh, you want to take it. So I think if you're a CEO of a company today, you have to have kind of a point of view of what's going on in the world. And, and you've got to invest around what that point of view is. So I, I would say there's kind of five big themes that, that I think about from a standpoint of uh, running GE. The, you know, the first one is just the reordering of the global economy. You kind of see that each and every day. I, I joined GE in 1982. In the decade of the 80s, the developed world really generated about 80% of the economic growth. In the next decade, the uh, emerging markets developing world will be 80% of, uh, of the economic growth. With all the volatility that's in Europe, the big message is that Europe will be a slower growth region. You know, my sense is that these problems have a way of getting solved. But what it means is you may have uh, you know, another five or 10 years of relatively slow growth in Europe. For a, a businessman of my generation, you, I've already seen 25 years of slow growth in Europe, so you know, you're a little bit conditioned for what, 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 that, might actually, uh, what that might actually mean and aren't overly, uh, uh, you know, I'd say we're all concerned, but, but, but see that. So a reordering of the global economy, number one. I'd say the second big thing is just the, the notion of productivity and cost. The, the whole uh, aspect and focus on having what I call more products and more price points. You know, as, as emerging markets grow, and even as customers in the developed world have to have, to have uh, you know, lower cost products, uh, we're going to have a, a lower cost, high quality uh, generation of technologies. And you've got to be able to sell products at lower price points and make good margins. You know, uh, one of the staples of our healthcare business is uh, uh, an MR scanner that has a certain field strength, one and a half Tesla. And you know, it typically gets sold for one and a half to two million dollars in the vast majority of applications. You know, we're developing a product in China that can, uh, one and a half Tesla MR that can be sold for $500,000. And it's got 55 or 60% margins. And so you know, you're gonna have to have a, a real sense for productivity. Uh, resource scarcity. In some way, shape, or form, your generation is gonna live with uh, with resource scarcity. And what that means, two things really. One is that the resource rich parts of the world are gonna be quite interesting. You know, no one should have to explain to any business person China and India today. You know, if you don't already have that by the time you get out of Stanford Business School, there's not one thing I can do for you, you know, fundamentally. <laughs> uh, but places like Angola are gonna be quite interesting in your lifetime. You know, uh, uh, the, uh, the stands, you know, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, these are going to be quite interesting. There will be some form of reemergence of Russia uh, over the next uh, few years. So a focus on both resource-rich parts of the world, but also on conservation technologies. And what do you do uh, post-oil spill in the Gulf? And how do, you, how do you take on these big, you know, kind of conservation economies are going to be uh, quite important. So that's, uh, that's the third thing. The fourth thing is just the notion of being a networked uh, uh, world. You know, I, I don't say that. I say that both substantively from a standpoint of what you can do uh, from, a, uh, from an information technology standpoint, but also just the importance of collaborations, uh, innovation, joint ventures. You know, a lot of what uh, GE does today uh, in, in a growth standpoint is in the form of joint ventures. Uh, Intel and GE are going to do a 50-50 joint venture in home health. We couldn't get there necessarily on our own. They couldn't get there on their own. But having the ability to be networked and, and, and collaborative from a substantive and strategic standpoint is also, uh, is also quite important. And then the fifth one is just you know, the state economy. You, you are in, in a, gonna graduate from here with the government intersecting more with business than, uh, than the last 28 years of my career, you know, basically uh, when I joined in 1982, there was a complete disassembling of uh, government impact on business for almost 30 years. Uh, whether the Republicans get back into uh, power in the U.S., this is unlikely going to stop in the short term. And then you add to that Brussels. I mean, 60% of G's outside the United States, 
Brussels, Beijing, all the other governments in the world are quite influential. So this notion of being able. So, so these are the five things we think about as background in terms of how do we plan our strategy and, and, uh, and what do we do. And we take it uh, very seriously from a standpoint of how we view it. Now, uh, the, the lectures on leadership, so that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time really talking about. Because I, you know, my thesis is that leadership has almost no shelf life. That basically the things you're learning, you know, while you're here, I hate to, because you've shot out a fortune for your education, <laughs> going to be pretty irrelevant rel relatively soon. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, so you have to be kind of thinking about what's next. And we spend about a billion dollars as a company on education, and we, we kind of do it in four uh, attributes. My, my first advice, and we spend a lot of time when people join the company, your career is going to have to be deep first and broad second. Uh, the notion of leaving here as a general manager is not going to happen. You've you got to be good at something, and we want our people to be good at something, whether it's a function like uh, financial marketing or whether it's a business like wind power or th things like that. So you're going to build a career that's deep first and broad second. I grew up in a generation where basically people were taught general management. Nothing is managed generally anymore. <coughs> So, so I, I would say that is a very profound difference between the world I grew up in and the world that, uh, that you grew up in. Then we do a lot of training on leadership. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the traits that we try. But we try to match the way we assess people and what we're trying to train them on. And we believe a lot in continuing education. And we learn from others. We, we study people as diverse as Google and the US Military Academy to get good techniques to how to train leaders. Then we rotate. We've got 50 big P&Ls inside the company, and we rotate them in on about every 18 months to do team-based training. How do you invest for growth? How do you make sure you win? How are you benchmarking your competitors? We make sure to give every business kind of an update on, on, uh, on, uh, on leadership and, and how they execute better as a team. And then uh, uh, the fourth thing we do is a lot on, you know, really the, the predominant theme for me right now in G is managing a global enterprise. So we work a lot on the hardware and software of how do you manage a, a company as diverse. And like I said, we're, we're probably $100 billion outside the United States. I joined G in 1982. The whole company was $24 billion. Now we have $40 billion just in the emerging markets alone. So it just shows you kind of in one generation how much a company can, uh, can change. So that's, that's what we do on leadership. So now what I thought I'd do is just change gears and kind of give you, a, you know, kind of 10 things that I'm thinking about vis-a-vis uh, what the next five or 10 years of leadership training, leadership development, some of the things you ought to be thinking about as you're leaving here and, uh, and starting a career. And the first one is what I would call analytical listening. Analytical listening. You know, why did the financial crisis happen? What could we who are running companies, what could we have ne known and learned about faster? How can you do a better job of, of, of kind of Opening up, up outside uh, forces and still, uh, 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 you, you know, running a company at the same time. So analytical listening, surrounding yourself with people you trust, listening to them, matching it with data, and and uh, and working with it. In 2007, I was at the G Capital Board meeting and we saw a deal come in and and uh, it had no in, in financial services and this was a private equity firm that was going to borrow money on a deal that they were doing. And they were able to get more debt than the size of their deal. There were no covenants. They could basically reset the loan in 24 months, right? And I said, this is strange, right? This is not the way capitalism was meant to work, you know? <laughs> and so we didn't approve the deal. And I hired McKinsey, and I spent $3 million with McKinsey and said, I want you to go study, is this liquidity, massive liquidity, going to you know, go on forever? And they came back 60 days later and said, Absolutely. <laughs> this is, uh, is going to happen. You know, Don't worry about a thing. You've got all these sovereign wealth funds. You've got all this other stuff going on. So I tried to listen, I swear. You know, I, really, I really did. But I think what we've tried to do, what we've tried to replace that with is finding the people, you know, finding the people that write critical stuff about GE, the naysayers. Who are the naysayers? Uh, out there and giving them a voice inside the company. And when I talk about analytical listening, I, I talk about really having red team, blue team, having the people that are your worst critics, letting them inside uh, where you are. And that, you know, that's a way that you have to be, break down the barriers of, of, of how you listen. But uh, I've never met one successful person in any field of life who wasn't a great 
listener who wasn't curious about stuff. And you're going to have to have a career of leadership that's all about that. The second one is adaptability and, and perseverance and just being able to deal with volatility. You know, uh, this is just a more volatile world. This is just a more volatile world. I mean, we're dealing with, uh, you know, there hasn't been really a global business person that's thought about Greece for 2,500 years, right? <laughs> and now, I mean, fundamentally, now, now, man, it's like, friggin' Greece, you gotta be kidding me, you know? So, so, you know, there's something about the world we live in that's just more volatile. It's, it's interconnected. And so, you know, you want a company like mine that's got 285,000 people. It's $160 billion in revenue. You've got to run it with an operating plan. You know, yet, yet the world that your managers are dealing with is just more volatile than it used to be. And, and uh, you've got to find a way to buffer your investors or your employees from these wild swings in, in, in volatility. And, you know, that's something that I think is, you know, quite important. And the way, you know, the way we try to do it is recognize, uh, you know, just how volatile the world is, how adaptable you have to be. And there'll be businesses that basically... I run, you know, I run without an operating plan for 2010. I, I have rough boundaries on where they're gonna go. And then the other businesses that I have tight controls over. And then in 2011, maybe the businesses that didn't have as tight a plan in 2010 will have a tighter plan. But, but managing your careers and, and being managers that know how to, how to deal with adaptability is really, is really good. You know, from, two, from 1982 till 2003, fundamentally the price of oil was $15 a barrel. The U.S. economy really grew for about 4.5% every year. Baby boomers were in their peak consumption period. Those were 20 pretty good years. I just think we live in a, in a generation now where about every two or three years, you are going to be shocked. You know? I mean, we, I own, I, you know, we own NBC. Uh, you know, when, seeing, when Squawk Box is on on Sunday night, I know something's wrong. You know, that's too much, too much volatility. Uh, the third thing is just the notion of managing and being very open to managing relationships, connections. A lot of you, I don't know how many people here will go to IT startups and, and things like that. I'm, I'm sure it's a big chunk. You can feel free to raise your hand. I'm not going to, there's nothing wrong. Okay, I just was curious. <laughs> but I mean, you, you know, you think about, you know, technically trying to be, uh, geez, we've got a big installed base of products. And with sensing technologies and information technology, you know, I, I basically know what every jet engine is doing in the installed base in the fleet right now. You know, I, I know the fuel efficiency. I, I know how, how it's operating. You know, we can kind of study how every CT scanner is being used. But being able to know how to take this pervasive information, turn it into real knowledge, that is one aspect of just what, what your generation is going to have to know how to do. And the other piece is just being a good partner. And that's not only to other companies, but it's also to, uh, 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 you know, the government. You know, ha having an ability to, per to, to really thrive and impact and be a, uh, you know, know how to manage relationships is going to be very, uh, very important. So, you know, I, I think it's more uh, seeing things from, from the other people's point of view. It's, it's the willingness to, to partner, the willingness to accept information on a pervasive basis. This whole area of, of the network society, I think, is, uh, is quite important. Fourth, knows how to uh, simplify um, everything. N knows how to create simple structures, simple metrics, and accountability. I mean, th this sounds incredibly basic, but when I go in after a business has failed, Right? When you study on TV, uh, the spill in the Gulf, right? do, you see, do, you, do you sense uh, simple lines of accountability, people whose metrics were aligned? You know, when you go into any crisis in a residual way, that's what I always see. Uh, we're big in the water business. We've got a $2.5 billion water business, and we fundamentally uh, did it through acquisitions. We did about 10 or 12 acquisitions relatively quickly. We liked the space. We wanted to be in it, and we, we, we did it more uh, inorganic, or we did it more inorgan inorganically than organically. About three years ago, the business hit the wall, really hit the wall. So I fly down. And you know, the first thing I always start you know, when you're in a crisis is how are you organized? So the CEO put the organization chart up there, unintelligible. 
you know, we, we had taken all of these acquisitions and put them in like a nice, neat GE matrix. So nobody knew what their measurements were or who the who they work for, you know? <laughs> and they, and they and, and, you know, you sit there and like in the first 15 minutes you say, we are screwed, you know? This is, you know, and, and uh, metrics not aligned, organization chart unintelligible, nobody was accountable. You know, one person, the CEO might have been accountable for the P&L, but it was distributed throughout the uh, organization. So, you know, anytime you get that, you're gonna go through a leadership change, right? And, and you come back and, and you know, the person comes back and says, you know, I know we wanted to make it this deep, but let's decouple some of these things. And you know, three years later, you have real simplicity and real focus, and, and, and that's something to always, in your own life and career and in your early jobs, is make sure you know how you're measured. If, if you go into private equity, you know, make sure you know how to set up clear lines of accountability that are simple and well understood, really critical. Number five. This is something every school does poorly, and I would, my sense is that Stanford does as well, though this is a great place, is we need a generation of systems, systems thinkers. You know, people that know how to pull together disparate thoughts into uh, solutions. Um, there's two problems that I kind of thought while I was at uh, COGE that I could have some kind of impact on. One is clean energy, and the other one's affordable health care. And in 2005, uh, we, um, launched an initiative called Eco-Imagination, and in 2009 we launched a, an initiative called Health Imagination, all of them really addressing how do we make money for investors by solving big problems at the same time. Um, is energy an innovation challenge? Yeah, yeah, kind of, you know. But I can guarantee you in energy there will be really innovative solutions that never see the light of day. Is the public policy problem? You, you bet. Right? So when uh, all of your world gets set by the price of a barrel of oil today, and most of your assets are going to live 30 or 40 years, the only thing that can bridge those two time horizons is public policy. Is energy a manufacturing challenge? <laughs> you bet. Because unlike information technology and healthcare to a certain extent, best in breed almost never wins in energy. This is a study of the second best solution well executed. The second best solution at low cost almost always trumps the in most innovative solution that's high price. So if you're passionate about it, I don't know how many people here are going to leave here and go into an energy related field. Probably a bunch of you. And you guys are probably passionate about the science and all that stuff. You better be a systems thinker. You better be a problem solver because vision ain't going to get you there. And that's something that I find colleges and business schools have done a bad job of really training. Most, most really important things that, uh, that matter really require that kind of, of uh, disciplined thinking. A six, you know, the courage and patience to see a uh, solution through. You know, too many people, particularly in big businesses, but across the board, investors, things like that, are just, are just uh, uh, day traders. You know, there's just too many people that... Uh, you know, doing important new things really takes time. And, and the ability to stick with and fund an innovation and a technology through a cycle, over a cycle, is really extraordinarily important. One of the places where we've put capital, a lot of capital, is in, you know, molecular diagnostics. You know, we're a big di diagnostics company. We do diagnostic imaging and life sciences and and uh, uh, information technology and healthcare. We've got about a $20 billion healthcare business. And so, you know, about in 2003, you know, we just wanted to make a real bet that said, you know, someday you're going to be able to uh, screen Alzheimer's in a living patient, work with, a, work with a, uh, a drug company that can retard the onset of Alzheimer's. And, and if you can take the most difficult symptoms and delay them by five years, that's a $60 billion savings to the healthcare system. What I just described to you is 12 years. 12 years, right? So, you know, our investors don't always like it. Our employees sometimes get bored, you know. But if you want to do really neat stuff over time, it's going to take this incredible, you know, vision and incredible dedication to stick with uh, a generation of Technology. We'll do the jet engine for uh, 
the Boeing 787. It's a billion dollar plus program. It'll break even in eight years, maybe, something like that. So, so the notion to kind of stick with things and, and be able to, to bet is something that really sometimes is frustrating in big companies because we don't do it enough. Seven, so, this is what I've learned the hard way a couple times, which is, um, you know, I think really critically important for you guys as, you know, a lot of you will go to work in consulting or, or I don't know how many people here will go to work in consulting. Come on, be brave. It's, it's really, <laughs> seriously, there's nothing wrong. I like consultants. It's uh, knowing and understanding, you know, and, and, and this is something I've, I've thought about for a long time. Knowing and understanding how things fail. Now, typically, it's easy. It's really fun to know when things are successful what they look what they look like, but knowing the mode of failure of ideas and projects and, and how to get a good conversation about. I, I guarantee you that nobody on Wall Street or nobody involved in subprime mortgages really said, "Okay, you know, if everything went wrong, what will it cost?" Right? I guarantee you, nobody ever said two trillion dollars. You know, somebody said 200 million bucks, you know. They didn't do the analysis, they didn't ask. But this whole notion of designing systems to be reliable, designing, you know, leadership processes for reliability, that's what financial reform is about. That's, that's what the financial crisis is about. That's what the Gulf spill is about, it is kind of business and ecosystems that are just not reliable enough. I, I, I go back to my aircraft engines business. You know, the FAA, right, and you want it to be this way because we all fly planes. The FAA, when, when a, a plane, God forbid, crashes, right, I've got 200 people that work in the aircraft business that this is all they do. It's like poetry in motion. You know, they go to the site, they analyze the black box, they know what happened. These guys know within 24 hours, basically, every crash that, that since I've been CEO that's taken place. It, it is not that you, that you want to brag about that, but that's a system that works. And, and so we're going to have to build that on a global basis in lots of different industries. And being a, being a leader that knows how to ask, not the fun question, but the ones around mode of failure and being willing to dig and stick to it and, and ask questions until you're satisfied that you've had that kind of, that kind of uh, focus is really, uh, uh, really is important. Eight, something that I, I will a little bit about your generation and, and it's, People have to know how to manage people that are different than they are. You know, you, you just, too many of you like hanging around with you. You know, and, and, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but, you know, when I look at some of the, um, angst that's in the global economy today, you know, basically the average American, and I'll say it because that's where we are, even though we're a global company, says they're angry at Wall Street, but really doesn't know what happens on Wall Street. You know, so that's not really why they're angry. They're angry because they got left behind. And they got left behind because people that are graduating from this place fundamentally don't care about creating jobs. And that's why they don't, you know, the day you step out of here, most Americans aren't going to like you because they think you're affluent and you're arrogant and you just don't give a shit about anything but yourself. And so, you know, I encourage you early in your career, and I'm not here, look, I, I'm a capitalist, so I'm not here to give you any preaching stories. I, I say it for your own leadership skills. I, I would find way, you know, you just have to train yourself to like hourly factory workers, salespeople, uh, the people on the front lines of whatever organization that you uh, bench chemists, and, and learn how to motivate those people and, and sit with them and understand the world through their eyes. And, and that's as important as anything you, know, you learn here. You know, I, I say this every business school I go to. The class I hated in business school was organizational behavior. <laughs> hated it. I thought it was boring. I thought it was stupid. I said, why, why, when can we get back in finance? Right? Today, I never do finance anymore. Right? All I do is organizational behavior. It's like, it's like punishing me for all my sins after, <laughs> after, all, this, uh, after all this time. So, so no, no, uh, no something about that. Um, leads from the front. You know, too few people are accountable. Uh, and that's something that's really important. Um, and people have to, you know, have to be uh, 
more well known for being in front of their companies and protecting their reputation. And look, this has been a challenge. If you were running anybody in financial services the day the Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, let me tell you, you've taken some shots. I sure have. I mean, you know, it's just, you just weren't going to, there was no place to hide when the storm started, right? So the difference is, is you, know, you know, I got tougher through the whole thing about fighting for my company, being willing to go and protect and be accountable and stand up for what GE was about. And people didn't always love us, right? But, but we were able to maintain our reputation and respect because we're accountable. You know, and I, I just think that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a whole thing. Now, most of you, look, and I, I think you should. You should want to go make a lot of money. You absolutely should. There's nothing wrong with that, nothing at all. There's a few points in your career when you shouldn't make a lot of money, right? There's a few points in your career when you got to step back and say, you know what? I earned a lot of money this year. I deserve a lot of money this year. I like making a lot of money, but I'm not going to take a bonus. Why? Because I've been around a long time, I have perspective, I have context, and I'm accountable for reputation, whether it's deserved or not. And so my message to you is not, you know, I want you to be aggressive and competitive and capitalistic and wanting to make a lot of money. But I guarantee you in the next 30 years, there's going to be like two or three or four years where you, you will have earned a lot of money, and it's your judgment. There's no Washington law. There is no a board of directors that's going to tell you when the time is right to step back and say, not this year, not now. That's got to come from you, and that's, why, why, that's what people call authenticity. That's what people call, you know, kind of accountability. And you should want to be that way. Lastly, it always helps, helps to be a leader if you actually like people. You know, it's a, you know, it is one of those things that's quite weird. I worked for a lot of bosses in my career who didn't, just didn't like people, you know. The last one actually did, I have to say, you know, so he was uh, 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 Welch, uh, but, but uh, you know, simple things, you know, about uh, treating people with respect and, and uh, wanting to get the most out of them actually, uh, actually go a long ways. So those are kind of five or ten things that we try to incorporate into the way we train our leaders and, and the way we think about leadership. Uh, I actually, like I say, about every five years we, we try to upgrade you, know, you, you have to have a long enough gestation on how, what you're training your managers so that you can drill it in your organization, but you can't stay stale from a standpoint of what people are thinking about. So I, I'd say we kind of run in a four or five year cycle about what we're, what we're trying to, how we're trying to upgrade leadership and, and what we're trying to, uh, to teach people. So that's my, uh, that's my, uh, that's my shtick on leadership. You know, good leader, in the end, what, is a, what does a CEO do? I think you know, basically I have two jobs. You know, I drive change. You know, fundamentally, the leader of a company like GE, you know, my job is to really, is to really drive change uh, and to develop other people. You know, you've, you've got, you, you, are, you are solely responsible for the culture and the values that permeate, uh, permeate the company. So let me turn it over to you. Talk about whatever, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. First of all, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your early career? You said you started with GE in 1982 and how you managed your career, if you had a vision, uh, what your thoughts on leadership were, and you know, what some of the milestones or obstacles you may have faced, especially in a big company like GE. And yeah, project. so I looked at it as like a five-year. So I went to work in uh, 82, and I was worked during a plastics business. And I basically, my first job was to be kind of a product manager to sell plastic into uh, instrument panels of cars. And this was in the early 80s, and CAFE standards had just been passed in Detroit. And this whole conversion from metal to plastic was, uh, was quite uh, significant. And so I, was the, I would go sell a product called Neril into pickup trucks. On, on cars, and I had a kind of a five-year uh, five vision, and, and um, uh, wanted to, you know, kind of get into sales, you know, in other words, what I wanted to start doing was being, a, you know, broadening my capabilities, so I went from marketing to sales, uh, and I think early in your career, it's really about getting good at something, 
you know, being recognized for, you know, I was a good, good sales and marketing person, and I kind of grew up through the plastics business, and I tried to go after tough jobs, and I tried to, uh, I, I tried to get known early on as being a good manager. So I, people liked working, you know, I, I wanted people to like working for me and relating to, so I, I went from there to running a big sales force in, in the organization. I had probably half the U.S. Uh, from a sales standpoint. So I, I, I tried to model my first five years on getting good at something. And then, and then from there, becoming deep. And then in 1988 or 89, so I'd been there maybe seven or eight years, I'd given a presentation to Larry Bossidy in the uh, plastics business, and you know, I was doing pretty well and was well recognized. And then a call comes one day, and my search says, it's Jack Welch. You know? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, I thought it was one of my sales friends who was just you know, busting my ass on, uh, on like it's. So he said, look, Jeff, uh, you're doing great. We love you in plastics, but we're having this incredible uh, compressor failure in our appliance business. And I need an outside, I, I need a young talent, outside set of eyes. I know you don't know anything about it, but, but I need a change right now and somebody that's got the passion. And, and uh, he said, uh, and I don't like any of your bosses out there. You don't work for them, you work for me. Hangs up the phone. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like 33 years old and I'm saying, man, this is what's going on here, right? And that job probably made my, it was a brutal job for three years. It was, it was so tough. But that was my break. And you know, I wouldn't be CEO today if, if he hadn't reached down, which I try to do, and gave me a high risk, high reward uh, 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 job. And, and so that's, so, so you, know, you kind of gotta, you gotta have a couple five year plans. And I don't think you can ever dream about being the CEO of G or P&G or something like that. It's just too weird, you know? So much, luck, so much luck involved, and I think what you do is you build, if you want a, a company life, what you do is you build a great foundation of accomplishment and networking, and, and things have a way, you know, at, at higher levels of companies are really taking care of themselves. And if you don't do it here, you can do it someplace else. But I'd stay focused coming out here on your first five years. And, and it's a, and do what you, you know, kind of like don't, play for the triple banker. Right? I see a lot of business school kids that say, okay, I'm gonna, I wanna run GE someday, right? So because I wanna run GE someday, I'm gonna go to work at BCG. I say, you know, <laughs> you know maybe. But I, I, you know, I just really, I, I know the guy that runs BCG. I'm quite fond of him. We are as different. Our experiences, our capabilities are about as different as is humanly possible, right? <laughs> So I, I think that's what I call like the triple banker. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I say if you want to join venture capital, join venture capital. If you want to do private, if you want to join a company, join a company. 20, when you come back to your 20 year reunion, successful people will be successful. And, and the pathways will be wildly different. Jamie Dimon was my good friend in business school. We've been friends for 30 years. He went to work for Sandy Weil. You know, I went to sell plastic and instrument panels. We both did okay, you know, it, it, it kind of, in the end it all, it all worked out. But our pathways, I moved nine times, you know, he stayed in New York. But we're great pals, we, 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 we all do, we do our thing differently, but we do it effectively, I hope. And, and that's, that's what happens. But fall in love with your job, let it, let it go. Don't, don't worry about what your classmates are doing. Fall in love and let it, let it happen. Other questions? Yeah, right there. I don't know how we get the mic to you, but. Thanks for coming, Jeff. Uh, speaking of Jack Welch, you had some pretty big shoes to fill back when you took over, which you've done pretty successfully. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that transition phase and how you went about implementing your own leadership style and in the process establishing your own legacy at GE. So I'd say if, if given a choice, it's a lot easier to follow a failure. So that'd be just a, <laughs> just, a, uh, just some words of advice if you, if you get that choice. Uh, uh, <laughs> leadership is really a, a one-act uh, play, you know, and, and I never really thought about my job in terms of uh, following Jack Welch. And, and the trick when you follow somebody famous is you got to drive change every day without ever pretending anything was ever wrong. And, and so you, it, it takes self-confidence and it takes, 
it takes time, and you, you don't need to obviously, you know, draw the differentiation between uh, the two of you. You know, I, I learned a lot from Jack. I think Jack was a great CEO, and and it's just that, you know, 2010 is as different from 1997 as it is from 1927, and 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 there's just really no comparison to the worlds we're in. It doesn't mean that some of the fundamentals of business, like like integrity and performance, aren't the same. But look, in your life, you're going to follow some successful bosses. And I, I think the trick is to do it your way, keep your mouth shut, you know, just, just say, hey, there's, we have no problems, really, fundamentally. And, and let, let your own pathway work. And in the end, that's what people want. That's what our board wanted. That's what our team wanted, is, is just, uh, you know, people want leadership change in a world where leadership has no shelf life. And, and, that, and you just have to go with it. Yeah, over here. You mentioned the idea of reverse innovation before. So my question is, um, do you think it is a main trend for the global companies to uh, develop the technologies and products in the developing countries in future? And do you see any um, challenges or concerns in this kind of innovation approach? Thank you. So, so you know, we've talked a lot about this thing called reverse innovation. You know, companies like GE have been in, uh, you know, globally dispersed for. 20 years in some cases, but certainly 10 years in a lot of cases. And we have big research centers in, in, uh, in China and India and Brazil and all over the world. So when I talk about, basically what I talk about is, you know, we all started selling basically American products globally. And then we localized manufacturing and, you know, kind of step by step by step. And now we have uh, great engineering and marketing teams in China and India. And what we're trying to do is understand the business models that get created in different regions uh, of the world so that as change takes place in the developed world, we can pull the technology or the, or the business model and become better, let's say, in Chicago, based on what we learned in China. Now, one of the things we've done in China, and, and healthcare is maybe the best example of this. One of the things we've done in China is we've got a huge healthcare business in China. We, we, we develop almost all of our own products there. And, so, you know, that's where the $500,000 MR is. That's where our V-Scan ultrasound, which is really an ultrasound with a PDA. And these are products that have markedly lower price points, but, you know, could be sold to a, uh, there's 2,000 hospitals in the U.S. that don't have an MR scanner, primarily rural hospitals, can be sold to a rural hospital that has never been able to afford that at a different price point. So that's what we mean by, by uh, reverse innovation. India is different. You know, what I find most fascinating about India is that it's, a, it's not just different technology, but it's a different business model. You, you know, and so how can we study the way that, let's say, healthcare information technology is done in India and bring that back to the U.S.? That becomes a, uh, a, uh, an established principle as well. Now, you know, your world, basically, guys my age basically could move work anywhere they wanted, anytime they wanted, with no consequence. So in the generation of American business leaders that are more or less my age, we were able to do whatever we wanted to do with no consequence. That's changed. That's changed. The advantage of a multi-business company like GE is we can do a little bit of stuff everywhere. And, and so if, if all we did was move all of our technology and all of our innovation to India or China, that would make us very unpopular with our customers in the U.S. And the, and the government. So the trick is to be agile enough as a company to do a lot of different things in a lot of different places and try to optimize your technology base and your cost base to be able to do those things. And that's what, you know, that's what we've prided ourselves on being good at, and that's what we really are trying to be good at today. You, know, you add to that, um, you know, we've driven lean through the company for almost 20 years now. Uh, you know, kind of lean manufacturing techniques. So we can make a refrigerator with an hour and a half of labor. If you can, if you have really weaned through your cycle time, you can almost start making things any place you want to, relatively cost efficient, regardless of difference in wages and things like that. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what we learned. So uh, the last thing, you know, just going to the person we're honoring here today, you know, sometimes there's, we started GenPack. GenPack's a great company. In its own day, that was kind of reverse innovation, really. What we did is we took call centers we had in the United States and we replicated them in India 
with better people at a lower cost. I mean, you know, when you, when you, get, when you get that, you know, when, you, when you're replacing people that have a high school education with people that are PhDs who you pay less, sometimes that works. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a, so, but, you know, I was convinced that we would choke Genpact if we just kept it as a GE business. And sometimes you've got to recognize what business models we can do a good job at. What, what, what is a good G business, and where are we better off letting things, uh, letting things go? Other questions? Yeah, right. Why don't you shout it out, and I'll repeat it, because they're never going to get a mic to you. Um, so I guess my question is, I think you rightly referenced the fact that many of us are going to leave here and join very small organizations, either investment managers or startups that we start or uh, go to help run. I guess my question is, you know, sitting as the leader of the preeminent trading ground or leaders of large organizations, what can we learn from GE, those of us who want to go to small companies? So, look, I think it's a great question. The, um, the question is, uh, small companies, what can you learn from big companies? Uh, there's a lot of things that are very transportable, right? In other words, I think uh, the, the idea on focus, the idea on how to motivate people. Relating, you know, relating to a variety of different people. You can really learn that really well in GE, and you might not get that from a 50-person startup or things like that. But there's other ways that uh, there's bad things to learn from big companies as well. You know, like like if you're running a startup, forget about Six Sigma for about 10 years. <laughs> you know, really, it's just you're you're going to waste money. It's not why people. It's not why you exist. And so the trick is keeping. Uh, Keeping the things that are good, and, and really, you know, you and I are alike, you know, I, I want to grow, you want to grow. I want to see ideas hit the streets, you want to see ideas hit the streets. So we've tried to make a company that aspirationally isn't that horribly different than a startup, you know, there's differences. You know, you come to GE, you work for me, right? If you want a boss, don't come to work for GE. You know, in other words, or if you don't want a boss, don't come to work for GE. If you want to be your own boss, join a startup, you know? Uh, I'm my own banker. That's my advantage, right? If you, if you don't want to go out and beg for money, join GE. I'm, I'm the bank. You only have to convince really a couple of people. A startup, different. We've tried to make GE a good convener. Um, I don't think it has to be either or. You know, we are a big collaborator with Kleiner Perkins at our Global Research Center. About every other month, we'll have big venture capital companies en masse come and share ideas and talk about things. We probably have 100 meaningful equity stakes in startup companies. Uh, and in those cases, we try to bring to them management practices that will work for them, but keep away things that, that, uh, that aren't going to work. You know, we, uh, we have a solar company we now own 60% of. It's in Colorado. It's a startup. You know, we, we don't really touch it that much. But when it comes time to have to go to the next commercial scale, that's going to cost 250 million bucks. On that day, we're good. You know, that, that's, that's uh, so the trick is knowing what works and what doesn't work and, and what things can be helpful to a company that's just starting up. But look, I have, a, I have immense respect and a lot of time for the venture capital community. I, I really do. I've, I've tried to develop good relationships, and I do think that is a strength in this country that is second to none. And I've tried to make GE a good partner to those firms. Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming, Jeff. You mentioned energy. Um, and uh, GE's gotten a lot of press recently for supporting the climate bill released this month, and uh, a lot of people project that the carbon market will grow to be $2 trillion, the world's largest commodity. Um, so I'm interested in knowing what you think is the likely outcome of, the, of this slow shift and uh, any opportunities for innovation that you see there. So I got into this game en masse probably in 2004, having no real... Um, environmental credibility, personally, more as a company. You know, in other words, um, I've never camped, really. <laughs> I, you know, I've never, I've never, uh, I've never planted a flower. Um, and I stopped mowing my own grass a long time ago, you know. So I'm not a, na I'm not a nature lover. But in 2004, and, and I, by the way, I spent 12 years of, in, of my career in our plastics business, where, you know, and you just grew to dislike environmentalists, really, <laughs> fundamentally. They, you know, there, there, was a healthy, there was a healthy angst between people in that industry and, and the environmental community. And in 2004, I think, or 2003, you know, we were sitting through our strategy sessions, and, and about five or six GE businesses were all working on energy efficiency or 
carbon reduction, you know? And so I sat and, and you know, kind of sat through all those presentations and said, gosh, we ought to try to pull this together as a corporate initiative and see if we can really up it a notch, up the R&D, up the public presence, up the marketing, up the customer engagement. And we did that and launched in 2005, and we had about, uh, we had, you know, kind of a, cert a third party that would certify these technologies, each of which would reduce the, their predecessor's carbon footprint by 25%. So we started with uh, 17 products, we now have 93 products. We started with about $5 billion in revenue. We'll hit $20 billion in revenue this year. So you know, our thesis was green is green. Uh, we run GE under the Kyoto Protocol. So we reduced our own carbon footprint, uh, reduced vis-a-vis the, carbon pro or the uh, Kyoto Protocol. And so that's how we got into it. So when we started, we, we created three teams. One studied uh, uh, public policy. Uh, one studied the science. And we, we had kind of a red team, blue team, studied the science. And, one team argued that uh, global warming was a hoax. The other team argued that, that global warming was a technical fact caused by man. And we tried to, we tried to be re, you know, relatively bipartisan about it. And, and then uh, one team talked to our customers, right? Our big utilities or, or airlines or things like that to try to frame. So we, we did uh, probably nine months of pre-work before we launched in a big way in 2005. And one of the things, if you're in the energy business for a long time, you know that it's a lot about innovation, but public policy is... Uh, you're just not going to, you know, it's just, uh, if you look today, probably the lowest incremental cost in the power generation field is nuclear power, right? It's probably the cleanest and lowest cost. All these plants are 25, 30 years old, and the CEOs that launched these plants 25 30, or 30 years ago all got fired. They were the biggest problems. They were horrible. Uh, the, the regulators wouldn't let them get finished. You know, so, so the cheapest electricity today was a place where everybody got fired 25 years ago. And when you see that, you know that nothing's really going to happen unless you have some form of energy policy. Now, if you're going to have energy policy, it ought to have energy security, it ought to have job creation, it ought to have a lot of things. But one of the aspects needs to be a price for carbon. You know, the vagaries of the market are just too circumstantial, and you need to be able to invest against some kind of constancy and price for carbon. You can do that through a tax. A tax is simpler, easier to administer, and some would argue the best way to go. Uh, environmentalists don't like it because it has no certainty around it. Another part is to do cap and trade, and, and that's been you know, very complicated in Europe. It creates a lot of bureaucracy to get it done, but it is certain in terms of where you go. I'm convinced we need one of those. Uh, you know, we, we've been on record to support energy legislation, and energy le legislation that has uh, cap and trade in it. I, I have very low hopes for what will happen this year, just given the political environment and things like that. But look, guys, you know, here's the, this is your own choice in your life. Because, you know, look, any one of you guys can do my job. If you, gra if you graduate from Stanford Business School, it's not about IQ. You are smart enough to do my job. Let's just get that out of the way. The question is, do you want to? You know, do, do, you, do you want to? And one of these weird things about life is to do something, you have to do something. I mean, it's one of these strange things. So, so here we are today, right? <laughs> we're sitting there, and uh, you know, we're in the oil and gas business, so I'm not, I'm not being critical, but we're sitting there looking at this, ec this environmental, really difficult. I, I mean, I don't know where it'll go, but boy, it is, this is one of the toughest things I've seen in my career, what's going on in the Gulf. In the meantime, we are doing nothing, zero, on energy. So people are giving speeches and all this other mumbo jumbo, nothing, as a country, on energy future. So I think that's wrong. That's wrong. And in my, in my corner of the world, GE is going to do stuff. We're going to up it. You know, we said we we're going to spend $10 billion in R&D between 05 and 10. We did it. We're going to do $15 billion between uh, 10 and 15. So we're going. I don't know if it's going to be in the U.S. or China or Turkey. We're going to go wherever we need to go to be effective. But we, you know, as this country has to be, look itself in the mirror and be really ashamed of where we are today in energy. And, and we're just, you know, we can be critical of BP if we want as a country, but boy, you're not doing anything. So you don't impress me. You know, as a citizen, I, I, I'm, I'm quite, I, I think it's very hard. Yeah. Um, 
So as per Garth's introduction of Ronick, three of the things that he really cared about were travel, relationships, and spirituality. So I was wondering how those show up in your life as a leader and as a person. So, um, you know, travel is, um, I, I think actually if you want to run a company like uh, GE, you have to be a globalist. And so you have to live a life that uh, sees things and touches people and is open to people. Uh, you can read a book on China. You know, you can read 30 books on China. That's why I wouldn't read one, you know? <laughs> if you go to China, go and spend hundreds of days, not just in Beijing and Shanghai, but in 30 other cities over 25, you know, look, I've been going to China since 1984. I, I have visited probably 30 cities. I've started two businesses from scratch. I've done joint ventures with the government. I've, 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 I know private business people. You want to be COGE? That's the path. You know, or any other company. So that's travel. What was the second one? So business is really a study of of, uh, of relationships, I, you know, I, my own view is that uh, people overuse the word. You know, in business, uh, if you can't make somebody more money, you're not a good partner. So I have kind of a linear view on what it means to be a good friend in business. <laughs> you know, to be, to be a good friend in business, uh, you, you, better, you better be able to see things through the other person's point of view. I'm on uh, President Obama's advisory board. I voted for McCain. Uh, I'm a Republican, but the president wanted to reach out and have different voices. When I go uh, and serve the president, my role isn't to say, here's what you should do. My role is to say, here's what I would do if I were you. Here's what I would do if I were you. Do you guys get the difference? You know, one has the benefit of context and relationship versus the other one is just giving a lecture. So relationships, you, you'll learn your own nuance. Look, spirituality, if you want to do anything important, people are going to hate you more days than they like you. People are going to not like you more days than they like you. And unless you can take a good punch and do it with a smile on your face, you went to the wrong place. <laughs> you, did, you, you, you chose the wrong vocation. You ought to be in divinity school or something like that. So you're going to have to have deep understanding of yourself. You're going to have to have other things in your life that are important than, than just your job. And, and you're going to have to have a sense that uh, a perseverance and, and optimism. And you know, if you ask me to describe myself, I'd say I'm a, I'm a tough-minded optimist. That's Jeff M.O. I, I, I'm tough-minded and then I like facts, I like data, I like doing stuff, I don't mind taking risks, but I'm an optimist because I like trying things, you know? Pessimists are just minimalists. They're, 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 just, they're just horrible minimalists, you know? That's not, I, I, I want to try things and do things and see where the world goes. And you know, the, what I would describe to people when they come to GE is, look, you're going to be in the front seat of history. You come to work for GE, you know, we're not a perfect company. But I guarantee you, where it's happening, what, what's going on, we're going to be somewhere close to where hi business history is taking place. That is the best calling card I can give for GE. Other questions? Yeah. Jeff. Just had a question. Um, you know, some of the lessons learned, if you could share with us some of the lessons learned and challenges faced during the recent financial crisis within your management team. Well, look, I think the, uh, the f there's a lot of different nuanced things you can answer on, on the financial crisis from both a system and individual. But again, I, I come back to um, listening harder being more uh, focused on all the risks and the downside. You know, again, we, we did studies, you know, the McKinsey study, stuff like that. But I think companies just didn't do enough tough, challenging, what if this goes wrong, and, and listen to naysayers enough. So, you know, that's, that's how we've tried to change inside, uh, inside GE and that, uh, inside the crisis. Take one more. Bonus question. 
Is that hand up? Way in the back. We'll make this sure, one. I'll on. ask a question. Um, <laughs> How do you think about, I mean, you, you talked about kind of uh, taking the right risks, and uh, how do you think about which uh, businesses to enter at what point and how to exit? I don't know if there were some specific processes or ways that you thought about that as a leader um, within GE. So I think when you run a company like GE, you know, a, a big multi-business company, um, uh, you need to be very tough-minded about the entrance and the exits. So we have a point of view about what we're good at, you know, what's our core business model, what, what does a good G business have. We try to study businesses that go through transitions, you know, like, like I was a plastics guy, I started my career, I sold the business three or four years ago because the, the industry itself had gone through a terrible, trans, you know, really a horrible transition. So we, you know, we could see that. So we, we try to study big trends, our own core competency, and then secular deviations that, that tell us what business we like and what businesses we should be transitioning away from. So today, we're the world's biggest infrastructure company and, and one of the bigger commercial finance companies. We like that mix of businesses, but that wasn't the company that I took over in 2001. It's very different than that company. You know, Intermedia, um, you know, it's, it's just, in the case of, of that specific decision, it was, what was the best use of capital in the GE context? And I saw so many investing opportunities in our energy and healthcare business that I just wasn't convinced that we were gonna take the capital and put it into media over the long term. And I, and, and I was convinced that the way the industry was going, you either were gonna to have to be a consolidator or you were gonna erode shareholder value. So, so that's why we did the joint venture with Comcast. Timing, you can't pick. You know, in other words, I, you know, if you're in, if you're in uh, private equity, timing is everything, really. If, you, if you're going to have a, if you're going to have a five-year hold or two-year hold or a seven-year hold, uh, in the case of GE, I, I think we have to be better at uh, business model match than picking the right time. Look, I, but look, when I, when I see the euro do what it's done the last couple of weeks, you know, the company's got maybe $100 billion of cash today. I look and say, where, where can we swoop? You know, I, I call the BD guys in. We look at our game boards. You know, every company in Europe that we've been looking at, you know, why not? If it's on strategy, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't on strategy. But sitting around at this moment in time with 100, you know, almost 100 billion of cash is not a bad hand to have you know, right now. So that's, uh, <laughs> this, may be, this may be a good time. Look, uh, have fun in your careers and, and be good. Thank you very much. Thank you.